This model, we're looking at a, what's called the open spinal cord model. <clears throat> Just to orient you, you can see the frontal lobes here and the olfactory bulbs and nerve tracts. So you have the midbrain, the pons, the medulla oblongata. Below the foramen magnum begins the spinal cord proper. And I'm going to move this model along as we follow down. So here's your spinal cord. This line that you're observing is the anterior median fissure. You'll also notice the beginning of the sympathetic chain ganglia that run on either side of the spinal cord. The other thing you might notice as I move this just a little bit is the, the width of the spinal cord here and here versus right here. This is the cervical enlar enlargement. You have a cervical and a lumbar enlargement. You do not have a thoracic nor a sacral enlargement. You'll also see corresponding spinal nerves extending from the spinal cord outward. If I move this a little further down, well, right now I'll stay here and observe the, the cervical plexus. You have four plexuses, or four plexi, a cervical, a brachial, a sacral, and a lumbar. This first one is the cervical plexus, and a plexus is simp simply an interweaving of the spinal nerves as they radiate out from the spinal cord. And these plexi, especially the brachial, are used to innervate the upper limbs. Uh, coming off the cervical plexus, you'll notice one, one special nerve here called the phrenic nerve. This innervates your diaphragm, which is why if somebody suffers a high cervical spinal injury, it often disrupts their ability to breathe on their own mechanics. Here's your brachial plexus. This will go in and extend to innervate muscles of the arm. As we move down, we're looking at largely the thoracic spinal nerves. And if you look closely, you can see right here is a dorsal root ganglion that would be bringing sensory information in through the dorsal root. This would be a ventral root bringing motor information out. These gray fibers you observe here at each segment are the denticulate ligaments that are going to help stabilize the position of the spinal cord so that as we bend and twist we don't shear these spinal nerves. It doesn't allow it to move. It allows it to flex but not slide within the spinal column. If we come further down you can see the most distal or inferior portion of the spinal cord proper called the conus medullaris. It's conical or cone-shaped. It terminates right here at about the level of L1, L2 vertebrae. Coming off of its tip is one central fiber called the filum terminale. This will extend down to blend with or fuse with the coccygeal ligament. So that coccygeal ligament secures it at the most caudal end and extensions of the dura mater will, it, will secure the spinal cord at the most cranial end. This series of fibers is called the cauda equina. Cauda as in caudal fin or caudate, and equina, equestrian, so it's the horsetail in lay terms. Here you can see extensions of spinal nerves coming together, forming your lumbar plexus. And if we take this even further down, you'll see the sacral plexus. Again, these two lower plexuses are designed for innervating the lower limbs. This is a nerve, the largest in your body, the sciatic nerve. Many people are familiar with this only because the condition of sciatica is such a painful and memorable one. If we come up just a little bit at looking at this nerve here, these are the femoral nerves. Everything here is bilateral, so you have a femoral nerve on either side.